Gaming Division. Hi there, welcome to Gaming Division. I'm Cam Rai, and this is gonna be our very first how to play, and that's gonna be with Munchkin. Now, I've had Munchkin for quite some time, so I've gone through a box or two. This is not the original of Munchkin, this is actually the uh, box for the expansion to the Munchkin Quest, which is the Dungeon Crawler, which we won't be using today. No matter which version of Munchkin you have, you're always going to have some of the same elements in play. You're going to have some very brief rules, no matter how worn they are. <laughs> Any practice gamer will have a baggie full of dice. Hopefully these colors show up clear enough on the camera. We're going to have a red player, a blue player, and a black player today. And of course, if you bought Munchkin, it should have came with the six-sided die, which is just a die or dice that has six sides. And then these ten-sided die will help keep track of our levels while we're playing. Now I'm going to use a blue, a red, and a black to keep track of the players in the game. Now, I'm not quite sure if you can see, but I'm going to set each of the 10 sided die to level 1 at the start of the game. You're also going to have two types of cards in the game. You're going to have door cards, which have a little door on the back of them. And you're going to have treasure cards, which are going to have treasure on the back of them. No matter what version you're playing, you will have some sort of equivalent to these. For today's purposes, I'm going to be using the original set with some of its expansions. You can get things like Pirates, or Call of the Thulu, or Zombies or Super Munchkin where you play as mutants or secret agents or as sci-fi characters. There's so many different ones it's hard to remember all of them. They're all actually compatible. They all use the same rules and they have equivalent things in each set. I'm also going to be going over some of the variants that I play with along with the standard rules. Uh, such as the standard rules say that you take two cards from either stack and you give those to the players. Now a variant that we like to use overpowers everything so that it gets the game started a little bit faster where you actually deal five of each to each player. As you can see, it's getting a little bit crowded here so I'm going to try my best to keep things clean and managed as we go. So let's go ahead and do that now. Which is going to give you a board that looks something like this. Now I've laid out all the equipment and such down the bottom rows for each of the three players. One, two, three. And the character cards up top where it clip. If you go ahead and play all your class, race, and equipment cards down right away, it helps facilitate the game a little bit and gets you going. Especially when you're playing with a five card start, it helps immensely to get cards out of your hand on the table and trading started. Because that is one of the things you can do, and one of the more fun aspects of the game is to wheel and deal with the other players trying to trick and outsmart each other. So we actually have an orcish bard, for the black player, he actually has a sleigh bells, an equipment usable only by a bard, a singing and dancing sword, a matic, because he managed to get a bonus card to his bonus card, and he's wearing a pantyhose of giant strength. We have a human wizard, who has a diadem of dexterity, which gives him an extra hand essentially, um, and he couldn't use any of his... I, uh, weapons, so we turn them sideways to show that they're not being used. There are one-shot cards as well, Potion of Flight, Monster Chow, that you can use as a one-shot bonus on monsters or munchkins. Our third player has a human with no class, a red player, who has a flaming crossbow, a liquid winch, which is a one-shot, uh, oil of Olay, which is a one-shot, and then later expansions has fancier things like uh, wizard hirelings, but it's essentially a lackey. You could have one assistant, and then you could have one steed as well. So this character managed to pull those from uh, the door deck uh, in the initial draw. Now, because some of these players have cards that other players can use, we're going to go ahead and we're going to do trading now. Oh my god! Alright, we just had a calamity by cat, so I apologize if everything's not where it should be. We're going to get back to trading. Now here's a little bit about trading. The rules say that you can only trade cards that are already on the table, not from your hand. We found arguments for exceptions and things, especially things like racing stripes, which go to a steed. You can't have this in play unless it's attached to a steed. He doesn't have a steed, so he can't play it. But he could paint racing stripes on the classless human's steed in exchange for whatever. Now because racing stripes only help in running away, Maybe you're willing, to, you're willing to take a low trade. So we trade the one shot to give the turtle racing stripes. Now, the turtle steed naturally gives you a minus one to run away, so this actually helps even him out a little bit. Okay, so now here's a chance to wheel and deal a little bit. The human wizard has a 
Orc Slug Thrower, only usable by Orc, which gives a plus five bonus but requires two hands. The Orc Bard is using one hand's worth of weaponry with, for a plus three bonus. So obviously it's better if he has the plus five currently. But because we can't end up with a net value that would make any sense, because the wizard can't use the sleigh bells either, so you can't trade one for one. You'd have to trade something else, like the pantyhose of giant strength would work, but so his bonus would go up or go down by one because he wouldn't be able to equip both of these at the same time. Now, to get past the boring science of it all, let's just suffice to say that no trade could be met. So what they can do instead is they can sell equipment. Now, the... Orc Slug Thrower is worth 800 gold. Not sure if you can see that or not. We'll find out later. Okay, so this Redward Staff is worth 600, and the Orc Slug Thrower is worth 8. You can sell both. Since they equal to or exceed 1,000 gold, you can actually sell cards to go up a level. So that's going to put our Wizard at level 2. So now we're ready to example a couple turns of play. Our Orcish Bard is going to go first. So what he's going to do is he's going to kick down the door, and he finds a level 12... Tongue Demon, a creature from hell. Plus four against clerics, and you must discard one item, your choice, before combat. Uh, we've added a plus four against females there because hentai is a bad influence. Now, looking at the items available, any item that is not big is a small item. He's going to go ahead and discard his monster chow because he wants to keep all his bonuses. So the way combat works is you are equal to the number of your raw level plus your bonuses, which is 1, plus 3 is 4, plus 2 is 6, plus 2 is 8, plus 3 is 11. Now this is a level 12 monster. In order to beat it, we have to exceed the level of the monster. So we need at least a 13, and we don't have it because we lost our monster chow. Now, because this is a how to play, I'm going to example how the bard works here. He has a ability called Enthrall. When facing a monster, you may discard three cards and select a rival. Each of you rolls a die, and if your rolls tie or beats his, he must help you and cannot ask for a reward. So, since we only need like two points, we're going to go ahead and pick this guy, our classless human. So, our orc rolled a 3, and our human rolled a 4, which means he doesn't have to help. Now, you can ask for assistance when battling something, instead of just being forced to. But typically that involves a bribe, especially after doing a shady move like that. So let's pretend, for sake of argument, that this character now refuses to help because they didn't like being forced. Oh well. So, he's going to ask for help from this character... And this character is going to demand two of the three treasures available, first pick, which is kind of strong. Now, you can go back and forth and counter and discuss how you want to get it. The fact is that you have to get this character to agree to help you in this situation. And let's say he just succumbs and says, yeah, you're going to have first two picks of the three treasures. Now, if we go ahead and add up our bonuses, we have a character with a technical level of 11. And we have a character with a technical level of 2, which adds to 13, which is higher than a level 12 tongue demon. That means that we should beat it. Now, now if you're playing with a group of friends, sometimes you'll dictate that nobody can mess with combats until level 4. What I mean by that is that during a combat, another character has the opportunity to use something like, oh, I don't know, a liquid winch to boost the monster's stats so that the monster can actually be stronger than the character's fighting it. So just for example, say, let's say the third character uses the Liquid Winch on the Tongue Demon. So now it is a level 15. What they can do to counter is use Oil of Olay on themselves to make this character plus 3. So now we're 1 up on the monster again. This character doesn't have any more one-shots. You can't really like just go on the other side and help the monster. So, we can go ahead and resolve combat. Give everybody one last chance to play cards from their hand to interfere with the monster. Womp, womp, womp. The monster is now dead. And we draw three treasures because there is assistance involved. We do it face up. And the second player gets first two picks of the treasure. So, they're going to go ahead and pick a plus three ghoul lash, not usable by bard which they couldn't use anyways. 
And then you take a plus one scary false teeth, which leaves the first character with the dagger of treachery, which they can't use. And the first character gains a level because it was during their turn. Now, bards also have something called bardic luck, which we could have drawn an extra treasure, looked at them all, and discarded one. This would have been what was discarded anyway, so no real loss there. Now, because we fought a monster, we're going to go ahead and clean everything up, and it's going to be the next character's turn. So this wizard is going to go ahead and kick down the door as well. A level 12 wannabe vampire. Instead of fighting, a cleric can chase the wannabe vampire away just by going booga booga, take all his treasure. There is no level increase for this. So now that this character is a 2, 3, 6, he's still not high enough to kill the wannabe vampire, so he's going to need help again. He's going to ask the third player for some assistance, which is going to give him plus 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 12 right there. So we know it's higher, we're going to give them an opportunity to mess with the monster. Womp, womp, womp. Vampire's dead. Three treasures. Let's say that the third player went first pick of the three. So we're going to draw three face up again. And this character is going to pick the Magnificent Hat. Which is a plus two, and it is essentially curse resistant. So people can't cast spells at him. Um... The plus three usable by halfling only barbecue fork, and the boots of running really fast. Again, because we fought a monster, we're going to go ahead and clean up. This character did go up one level. Don't forget to do that. And the third character is going to kick down the door. Now, because this character pulled a brood plus 10 to level a monster, play during combat, this monster is surrounded by its loathsome offspring. They do not count as separate creatures. If the monster is defeated, draw two extra treasure cards. Now, that actually goes to the character's hand, and then they have an opportunity to do one of two things. They can uh, loot the room, which means they just draw another door card, or they can do what's called looking for trouble, where they could play a monster out of their hand. So, we're going to go ahead and play level 2 Pitbull. Um, it's a level 2 character. This character is obviously high enough to defeat it. This character has nothing that it's going to do, and this character has nothing that's going to interfere, so he kills it. He goes up to level 2. Now that's one round of Munchkin, covering pretty much all of the basic rules. Now, there are several nuances about how the game works in certain scenarios, like asking for help. We find that it's boring for just one person to be allowed to help, and that's it, uh, when you can actually bribe other people into doing things. The most important rule as Munchkin is that if you get away with it, it's not cheating. So there are several different things you can do amongst the party to deal with cheating or coming to agreements on, like, hey, let's circumvent this this type of rule or that type of rule and typically everyone will keep it fair because it's in everyone's best interest to win the game more than it is to help other people cheat. For example, long time tradition with my groups over the years dealing with cheaters, it, you vote to kill the other person and if you do then he dies and uh, you loot their corpse. Now it should be sensible enough to check their level make sure that the rest of the party can kill them. But, um, that can be fun. Now, in the case that a character dies, there's a fun thing called loot the body. Essentially, you can let the other characters roll off, five, one, to see who goes first in looting your body. You can do these either face up or face down, it doesn't matter. And, uh, now that this character's dead, he keeps his level, his class, or race if he possibly had one, and then everyone else gets to pick everything else clean. So he's gonna grab that. He's going to grab that, 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 cha, 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 cha. So on the following turn, when it would be this character's turn, he's going to come back as a level 3 human wizard with uh, nothing, nothing at all. But what he is going to be able to do is draw new cards. By the rules, you draw two of each, just like you were if you were starting fresh. However, since you just died, there are some variants you can do, such as knocking him down a level, because he died, punish him a little bit. And if you're playing where you started overpowered, give him one less card in each stack than you started with to punish him. And each time you die, you reduce it by one. 
keep in mind that you can have as many cards with treasures down as you like, but you can only have one hireling, one steed uh, in play at any time. You can only have one piece of headgear active. You can only have one piece of footgear active. You can only have as many hands as you have active at any time, per the rules. Uh, you are allowed to discard or give away cards at any point. You're encouraged to give cards to the, the other players having trouble called charity uh, if you are holding too many cards. Typically, you're only allowed to have five cards in your hand at any time. If you have a sixth card, at the end of your turn, you're required to discard that sixth card. Typically, you give it away to a lesser player, or you can just throw it away to be mean. Uh, if you are a dwarf, you actually get six cards in your hand versus five, and uh, that's special. Now, there are items that are labeled big, like the Redwood Staff. You're only allowed to have one big item in hand unless you are a dwarf, or you have something like the Turtle Steed, which allows you to carry one extra big item. Uh, you can't have your hireling carry a big item for you, which is often helpful. Now, remember, the first player to win is the character to get to level 10. You can only get to level 10 by killing a monster or Divine Intervention, which is a special card that will raise clerics up one level. Now let's fast forward this a little bit and get us up to where everybody's comfortably for the win. So we now have our characters at 8, 9, and 9. Our orc is going to go ahead and kick down the door. A uh, plus 2 bonus war hireling. Yay! Now because the orc is not a stupid orc, per se, he is going to go ahead and sell his Potion of Flight along with his Barbecue Fork and his Thief Dagger, which is a combination of 1100, which is going to put him to level 9. Now, out of his hand, he is going to play a level 1 Egg to try to beat the game. Obviously, he is much higher than level 1. He's 9, 12... 14, 16, 19, 22, 24 with his hireling. That means that the other players have to try to boost this monster high enough to keep the orc from winning. So we're going to make that egg intelligent, which is plus 5 a level of monster, so he's now a level 6. We're also going to make it brood, which is plus 10, and 5 for armored. Now, normally that would only be a level 6, 16, 21, which is not high enough to stop the orc. But because he has a war hireling with him, this is actually a plus 10 to the level of monster, which puts it up to 26, which is higher than our bard, our level 24 orc. Now, he does have the option to discard the hireling in order to get rid of that plus 5. So now he's a level 22 versus a level 21. Now, because the other two players can't stop him from winning against this monster, he is going to win the game. So, it's always a good idea to try to save up your one-shot cards, your boosters, and everything for the end of the game to just prevent this situation from happening. Now, I did forget to mention how Running Away works. The way Running Away works is when you can't beat a monster, you determine that you can't get rid of it any way, shape, or form, or you don't want to fight it, you attempt to run away. You normally escape on a 5 or 6 on the roll of a d6. However, if you have penalties like minus 1 or plus 1, you add these into that. And if you fail to run away, you suffer the bad stuff on the monster's card. I'm going to go ahead and stop it there to keep this short. This is the first time that I've done one of these, so I'm not quite sure how this is going to look on camera. But hopefully it turned out okay and you had a good time watching it. Um... This uh, video does go out to Dinosaur. Uh, you asked for some advice on how to play Munchkin. Uh, this is what I came up with to try to example how to play a little better than trying to type in the comments. Hopefully this was a decent explanation, and I hope to hear back from you and anyone else in the comment section telling me how this format is and if you could see everything okay, if you thought something could have gone better, or whatever you, let me know, and uh, I'll try to do better with it next time. Uh, until then, I'm Camerai, and if you don't like me, bite me. If you want to see anything else we're up to, go ahead and click the annotations, 
and they'll take you to our other channels.